Well, good morning. Let's uh, let's kick this off. Welcome, everyone, and and thank you again for carving out some of uh, what I know is a busy Thursday. Um, my name is again is Oscar Durham. Um, I'm a managing director here, leading our supply chain and operations advisory practice. Uh, and since Q4 of last year, our team has had a significant uptick, as I'm sure you guys have too, in requests from our clients across multiple industries to help them better understand, to truly get their head around practically um, developing um, a response to the headwinds that we're seeing across supply chain and operations. Through our collaboration, we developed a lot of, of insight, uh, some interesting lessons learned, and the perspectives has helped our teams. And in the interest of helping the broader community of our, cl of our client partners to respond pragmatically, we pulled together some material that we're going to cover today um, to share with you, and we're excited about it. So I'd like to introduce the panelists that we pulled together. Uh, my partners on the call today are managing directors across the River on team. Uh, they represent various uh, industry teams and the leaders, all with over 20 years of combined industry experience, as well as advisory experience. From automotive, we have Chris Good. Good morning, Chris. Good morning, Oscar. Uh, from aerospace and defense, we have David Noletti. Good morning, David. Good morning. From our energy team in, in H-Town, Damon Cade. Good morning, Damon. Good morning, Oscar and all. Adrian Sawchuk joins us from our industrials team. Good morning, Adrian. Morning. And last but certainly not least, Spencer Ware from our retail and CPG team. Good morning, Spencer. Good, mor Good morning, Oscar. For those of you that have participated in some of our previous webinars, today's format is going to be a bit different. We've designated this one, this session to be a bit more collaborative across panel members and in sharing perspective on both what the industry is seeing, how they've adjusted their agendas, and how they're responding. Throughout the course of this discussion and presentation, We'll pose some survey questions to the audience and share the outcome in real time. Uh, and we'll use it as we can to guide our discussion. So without further ado, well, before we jump in, a few housekeeping items. Um, we will push this to all of you via email. Um, you'll have access to the webinar recording and the materials. Um, and the ability to opt in uh, via that email uh, for future invites, as well as connect with, with uh, the panelists. So thank you. So now, without further ado, let's jump in. So the topic today, addressing some of the headwinds that we're seeing in the market. So let's jump, let's start with um, a little background. Um, we've we have all seen the headlines that are signaling the headwinds for businesses of all shapes and sizes. More and more of our clients in public and private companies are expanding the diligence beyond finance to better understand how they deal with some of the operational challenges affecting their business as the country begins to reopen. As we see in a more connected uh, world, visibility has certainly expanded and our awareness of these unplanned events, these exogenous shocks that are shaping and reprioritizing business agendas, how we respond is becoming, um, is becoming more and more interesting. I think supply chain and operations has been more at the forefront now in the last six months than, than I think uh, we, we ever have been. Um, and from the research, what we've seen, these, uh, th these events are continuing in more in frequency and uh, in severity. And so our ability to work collaboratively across finance, operations, supply chain, sales, marketing, finance, um, it becomes more and more imperative. 
So a bit of macroeconomics to ground in. Um, the recovery continues to strengthen. We heard Chairman Powell talk through this uh, earlier this week and in remarks last week. As markets open up and businesses work towards resuming uh, post-pandemic operations. We heard from Chairman Powell last week, GDP is up uh, from the March forecast, as well as inflation, although he's characterized that inflation similar to what we're seeing in the lumber market. It's, it's temporary due to transitory supply chain and demand conditions, these conditions that we're all dealing with. We're seeing purchasing increasing uh, and stabilizing since Q4 of last year. But the supply chain, the supply and, and logistics constraints that we're seeing at our ports uh, across our distribution hubs through lack of shortage of drivers, um, the infrastructure, it's inhibited our ability to take advantage of this resurgent demand. I think Chairman Powell said it best. Turns out it's a heck of a lot easier to create demand than it is to bring supply chain back up to snuff. It's probably the quote of the week last week. Um, as we pivot to our industry leaders, let's introduce our first polling question for the audience. What is the biggest challenge facing your business today? Is it demand variability and supply chain constraints? Is it logistics and warehousing with the increase in the LMI index uh, driving prices up? Is it cash flow and financing? Is it labor? or others. David, you've been, you've been uh, very close to the aviation and defense uh, space for years now. What are you seeing as the biggest challenge in, in pick one, let's call it commercial aviation? Sure, um, commercial aviation right now, you know, we went from peak production in 2018 of about uh, 1,860 commercial aircraft by Boeing and Airbus combined. And then um, uh, we've seen that, that, that production level drop off by more than 50% in a, in a fairly short period of time. Uh, so for the supply chain and the commercial sector, you know, the biggest thing we're seeing is concerns about liquidity uh, and, and cash, basic cash flow and financing. You know, so they, they've been in a kind of an extended period of low demand now, and that uh, that that low demand is expected to continue for some time in the supply chain uh, and causing some concerns about uh, liquidity, particularly as we start to see a recovery take place in terms of aircraft demand and being able to finance the working capital that goes along with it. So cash flow and financing. Interesting. Um, yeah. The survey points to a different challenge, although I do want to talk about uh, a little bit of that labor and labor shortages, um, over 43%, followed by, interestingly enough, demand variability and supply chain constraints. Interesting feedback. Cash flow and financing uh, is, is a lot lower than we expected, 11%. Thank you very much. And then 9% other. You mentioned... Uh, you mentioned something interesting. <clears throat> you mentioned that the it was it was, it was a cash flow constraint, and I think the um, I think the one of the interesting conversations we had um, about a month and a half ago with one of the CEOs of a major um, aviation um, OEMs was intimately familiar with one of his key suppliers and was talking about financing for one of their suppliers. To have that degree of insight as, and this, this supplier was 120 million in revenue. Uh, so not something that for one of the major OEMs, you would think uh, the CEO of a multi-billion dollar organization would be that in the weeds on, but he was. That brought to yeah. mind too, not, it's not just financing for operations, not just financing for commercial aviation, but financing of our key suppliers and our the suppliers across the OEM base. As sure. we think about returning and recovering from probably the largest downturn in commercial aviation history, can you talk a little bit about what they're facing? 
Yeah, I, I mean, in the aerospace industry, um, you know, commercial aerospace is a little bit different. If you were in the automotive industry, I would suspect that a a hundred million dollar supplier would un, would be unlikely to be critical uh, to a company to a large OEM like Airbus or Boeing or an Embraer. But in the aviation industry, they are. There are numerous examples of lower middle market suppliers that play an absolutely critical role in a supply chain. Sometimes that's, you know, because of a unique capability or perhaps a history with a part or with a family of parts um, that are difficult to make. Uh, so you, you'll see uh, critical supplier lists with big big companies, both OEMs and tier ones that are comprised of relatively small businesses, and they have to pay attention to them. The difficulty comes into how do you analyze and triage a large supply base made up of very small private companies. Uh, that, that presents a unique challenge to the aerospace sector. Thank you. Good feedback. We've had a couple of... Uh questions posed by Willard McNett um, as well as Ryan Gross. Let's, let's, let's answer this one. And from the automotive perspective, um, Chris, can you jump in? Do you see supply chains moving back to the U.S.? We've talked, we've heard a lot about localization across uh, aviation as well as, uh, as well as the automotive industry, but from the automotive industry, localization is at the forefront. Can you can you respond to that question? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I started an auto in the 90s. I'm in Michigan, it's like the center of the auto world. And it's always been about, you know, low cost countries and, and lowest cost, landed cost, everything all in. But the supply chain for auto is extremely complex. It's global, as we can as we've seen, any kind of port issues, uh, any kind of pandemic issues like we had or SARS causes a, a a big slowdown in the auto industry. So I'm hearing a lot more talk and we're actually talking to a lot more clients about how do we balance that and bring some of the supply closer to home without a large impact. I mean, you don't want to bring it close to home and for 10 years pay for higher costs for what might happen. People right. don't really want to pay for risk mitigation. They just don't want risk to happen. Don't let it happen. So we are yeah. hearing that. Um, we'll see if the this crisis will finally cause that to, to occur. But uh, I mean, speaking Good response. Uh, yeah. yeah, broadly about auto, I mean, sometimes we forget if uh, we look at the first bullet here, it's still 2.5% of GDP. It's a big impact right. on the U.S. It is a big I number. Think, <laughs> yeah, we forgot, I think we've forgotten about that. I mean, it's kind of the old industry, right? It's, it's dying. It's coming back to electrification. But uh, you can see in these three charts things you're going to read in the Wall Street Journal. Just like Dave said for uh, his vertical, sales fell off. Production fell to zero. But interestingly enough, it came right back. So where aerospace has this issue where demand is not being created and they can't survive, auto is the opposite. We're having so much demand, we can't survive. Look at the lost sales from chip shortages. So when we talk about what's going on in the auto world, we'd like to go to closer to home. We go to uh, OESA, the Original Equipment Suppliers Association. They have 500 members, the people running the tier companies. OESA does a survey, as most companies do. And they came back off the survey right now, post COVID or the end of COVID here, more pessimistic than COVID. So if you look at the third bullet, first net pessimistic supplier outlook since Q1 of 2020. So because of short shortages of raw material, raw material prices, logistics costs, lack of labor, they're more concerned than they were when COVID hit, which I find absolutely shocking. So I'll pause there. That's a, a good, quick look at auto. Sales are back. Just having a hard time keeping up with demand. It's kind of crazy. The, the sales, in, at least in the Dallas and the Texas market, and I've spent some time in Colorado too, it echoes the same thing. You guys are probably seeing across the country. Buying a used car is more expensive than the mark-to-market of buying new cars. It's insane. Um, these, these prices not only affect the automotive market, but they're affecting the, uh, the commodities that we're buying. Um, Chris, can you comment, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, Adrian, can you comment a little bit about how some of the uptick and what we're seeing in commodity prices uh, and demand is, is having an effect on the in industrial sector? 
Yeah, sure, Oscar. Ha- happy to do so. Um, you know, it's similar story as in other, other industries, right? We saw a significant decrease in in demand. The supply chain shut down, uh, and now you know demand is, is re uh, reemerging, and the supply chain is trying to catch up. So this this supply demand imbalance not only driving price increases, but the lack of availability is starting to hinder production output. Um, you know, a couple charts here, just going to show, you know, what we know, uh, you know, housing starts uh, are, are, are incre- have increased materially, and that's driving shortages in some of the key commodities and price increases along lumber, um, you know, concrete, uh, metals, uh, same story, significant rise in, in, in prices uh, with declining uh, inventory. And we've seen in other commodities such as such as resin. Uh, I was talking to uh, a CEO of a, of a client recently who's uh, in the plastics manufacturing space um, and has seen not, not only resin price increases, but really lack of availability. And that's driving um, service levels and and on-time performance as customers. And the other piece, too, is um, also experiencing labor shortages um, in the in the plants. Um, You know, for them in this particular industry, they've got they're fortunate enough that they do have um, a pricing uh, mechanism passed through uh, for most customers. And and for those that they don't and and those customers don't accept the price increase, they're, they're in essence letting them go and focusing on on other customers. Um, so, you know, some of their actions, you know, they, they continue to focus on sourcing, trying to find alternative suppliers, um, expediting orders, which which obviously increases costs. Um, they're looking at their, their customers and products and, and prioritizing the more profitable ones and, and really having to allocate their, their resin raw material input, um, you know, to certain customers and to certain products. Uh, fortunately for them, uh, some of the competitors are actually in, 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 the, in the worse off uh, condition. And, and so while they're selectively turning down some customers, they're also selectively picking up some new customers. So, so pretty interesting there. Um, I've got a, a, another uh, client that's in the uh, instrument space, and they, they shut down their purchasing last spring, ran low on inventory. And now they're really uh, challenged to build back up their inventory. They've got significant part shortages, multi-month backlog. Um, and, you know, they're reacting in a couple of different ways. One, they're building their products partially and then putting mm-hmm. them to the side and then, um, and then adding um, components that they didn't have on hand later on and then shipping them out. Right. They're focusing on a, a you know kind of reprioritization on the daily basis of their demand and, and, and rationalizing the product portfolio and, and you know, trying to identify common platforms a, a, across uh, across their uh, product offerings. In, so those, in general, those things, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. Now back back to you, Oscar. Yeah. Thanks. Good insight. I, I think the. Um, I think in general, everyone's dealing with the rise in some of the commodity prices and in the automotive uh, aviation space and retail as well. Sometimes the customer is able to absorb that and others are not. Those that have taken advantage of buying low prior to uh, the pandemic um, are reaping the rewards now from a lower, you know, a a lower uh, cost base. But for other industries, the uptick in the uptick in commodity prices is a game changer. It's, it's actually turned the business back on. So let's shift to one of those industries. Damon, can you give us some some insight? Where are we this morning? Yesterday we were at 75, 73. Where are we this morning in oil and gas? Yeah, we're, we're right about where we left off yesterday, uh, 73, which is Close to a uh, five-year high, um, which is around seventy-four dollars WTI. Uh, yep. So you know things are looking up for oil for sure. Obviously, the the supply has been um, taken from all the storage areas, and we we just didn't have the replacement of of production fast enough. So we're we're you know 
from pre-pandemic about 13 million barrels a day us or we got down to about 10 million barrels a day and now we're about 11 million, million barrels a day and with that said we're um obviously we have a number of drilled and completed wells that are being completed um that were you know for lack of a better word in inventory for a while those are now having to be replaced by uh rig demand which has gone up almost um gone up quite a bit about 470 rigs right now today for us um our low is about 275 so we're up almost uh almost 200 from a year ago so we're seeing <clears throat> excuse me we're seeing that that rig demand come back uh a little bit slower than uh anticipated for normal normal economic uh, model recovery if you see that graph there on the right yeah uh, some of that is due to you know capital not being put back into the equipment to keep it maintained some of it's due to uh, a little bit of hesit hesitancy in the marketplace uh, mm -hmm. to spend um, and put the capital into these wells. And uh, another another kind of aspect of that is uh, the supply shor shortage in the OFS space. There's a number of these folks. Big uh, crunch. Yeah, a number of these folks in the OFS space, full foot service space, that uh, had to collapse or consolidate um, due to liquidity issues over the last uh, 12 months. So you have less supply. Therefore, you're seeing higher prices in the in for both rigs and uh, oil field services because there is there is less supply in the space now. So yeah, it's interesting. I was I was listening to um, I was listening to and, and talking with a, a former friend and former colleague that's over at uh, Cummins, and he was he was remarking that one of the you know they're they're a big supplier for Albert, and he said the demand had shifted not necessarily in uh, in um the degree of volume but the obviously volumes down but also that um the type of services and products that they were uh providing not just the equipment but a lot more rebuilds because the the teams and the crews had been stacked and so redeploying and turning back on um reinvesting in in production and the equipment that they're using on the pads is 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 more of a rebuilt just because they've been cold stacked for a bit. That's right. So the the challenges abound. Um, Spencer, from the retail and commercial side, thank you, Damon, for that insight. Um, from the retail and commercial side, what are what are you seeing? How are how are our client partners adjusting some of their agendas? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a good question, Oscar. You know, we're definitely seeing the, on the retail side um, issues in the supply chain, issues with, uh, you know, lack of inventory. Um, we're also seeing, you know, very you know, clear impacts of inflation, as many, you know, others commented on commodity prices and, and labor. I mean, from the, the labor standpoint, um, things started, you know, very early when, you know, we, we shut down, a lot of people shut down their, their distribution centers, um, to save some costs, so they didn't know, you know, where demand was going to be. When they opened them back up, they they found that the the labor wasn't there anymore. Their best workers had gone off and found other jobs. The most industrious individuals and the, you know, the ones that came back, um, you know, were less productive. And it was hard to train people with you know social distancing. Um, so you know, still working to get those you know DCs back to to full productivity. Um, the stores. Um, the labor issue there is getting worse. Um, at first, people thought they you know, were magically able to, um, you know, staff stores with you know, minimum shifts, and um, you know they were seeing you know, sales coming back. But what they didn't realize is that it was, they were really hidden by high conversions. People were coming in to buy; um, they weren't coming in to browse. Um, so as more people are coming in to, to browse and enjoying the you know, shopping experience, that they're seeing that you know, demand on, on labor get worse. And it's getting exacerbated by the, you know, the shift to back to going out in restaurants, right? You know, um, right. And, and restaurant managers are having a real hard time, you know, dealing with this, whether, um, you know, they don't have the labor. So, you know, they're doing things like, you know, shutting sections, uh, which should be frustrating to you know, customers who are waiting in line to, to get in. Um, they're limiting, you know, menus, um, lengthening some of the turns on the table. I mean, you'll see in, in QSR concepts, um, you, know, the, you know, people putting out signs, it's a, it's a limited menu. Um, right. And, uh, you know, p pivoting through their Oscar um, over to inflation, um, there's this classic concept of, you know, hyperinflation uh, and the, the pr uh, menu costs. We're, we're sort of in a unique, you know, technology and, um, you know, which is also technology point where the menu costs are lower. And it was compounded with the pandemic. 
So I don't know if yeah. anyone here has been to a restaurant and you're scanning your menu. Well, it's easier to change menu prices when you're just scanning it, right? If they're, uh, you can take items off easier, you can increase prices easier. Um, you, you can make those adjustments a little bit more on the, on the fly. So, yeah, that's a, a great lever that restaurants have been able to uh, pull, uh, pull that wasn't available in you know, previous um, inflationary periods. True. Um, one of the one of our friends with CBRE and uh, Collier's, we were having a discussion over lunch a couple of weeks back, and the uh, the the tradition across various retail storefront CPG, some of their clients, you know, they used to depend a lot on um, storefronts for margin, right, to augment the uh, the revenue and the lower margin on online products. And that contribution has diminished. Are you seeing that pick up now as the, as the storefronts begin to uh, reopen? It, it's twofold, Oscar. I mean, we're, we're seeing more, more volume in store and we're also you know, thinking about rethinking how to measure the productivity of the store. Um, you know, early on, you know, it, I would say 20 years ago, when I started doing this, it was taboo to close a store. And um, then there's a period of time say, well, we'll you know, pick it up online. Um, but now it's very clear there's a synergy between a store and your, your localized online demand. Uh, customers like the ability, if there's an issue with the product, to go right. into the store. Uh, and from a supply chain standpoint and from a margin standpoint, we, we'd love to get that customer in the store, right? Yeah. Um, you know, buy online, pick up in store. Not only is it cheaper to get picked up in store, um, but also you get another touch point with a customer and they may even you know, buy something else and, and return in store. Um, and retailers have realized how to adjust their KPIs to really incentivize the store managers to, to treat that customer with a lot of respect. I mean, early on, five, seven years ago, you know, at the store, that was a negative sale or they didn't get credit for the online sale. And so the, you know, the manager sort of ignored that customer and, and, and it's, you know, now they're going to win that trust back um, and it's going to be a much more positive experience. Yeah. The, the omni-channel experience and signals that are coming across those are creating some challenges uh, as well as opportunities. Before we shift to uh, what, what we're seeing and in response to some of those challenges, let's, uh, let's pause for another polling question if we can. So the question is, how are you responding to the headwinds? Is it more of a technology and data first push or are you method and process based? Are you investing in upskilling and retooling your team and workforce? Are you dealing with the burden of ineffective financing structures and restructuring in general, or considering workouts and turnarounds, or a combination of one or more. Chris, from your perspective, um, I'd, I'd love to hear this. I mean, traditionally automotive has led with technology, but is how are they responding now? Yeah, that's a good question, Oscar. And I think, you know, auto, it's difficult to answer the question because it depends on, on where you're at in the automotive supply chain. If you're the OEM, um, right, you're, and you're building like F-150s, you set your production schedule, it's set. You know, you yeah. know what color interior you're going to build because those interior, those seats come off the truck in the order in which you're going to put them in the trucks. Right. And that's why without the chips, they're building them and putting them in the parking lots. So as you go down further away from the OEM into the to tier ones, tier twos, tier threes, two, tier fours, you know, what we're seeing there is, you know, I've seen articles about is just in time dead, is lean dead. And the answer is no, it's not. But it was never yeah. fully just in time or lean. The further you get down, the, the smaller my clients are, the easier it is to do batch builds, right. uh, add in safety stock. But what we're seeing them do is, is they need help adjusting their schedules because automotive is always recently at the forefront of automation, right? They manage by exception. So right. the system, and if you're in the ERP system, if you're an MPNL or in purchasing, it tells you what purchase orders or what inbound logistics are not going to be on time. Go look at those. The problem right. is there's so many, we don't know if people to look at all of them. So the lower tiers are spending a lot of time burning their people out, trying to manually adjust their schedules. So 
right now, I don't think uh, they're really implementing anything new. They're kind of going back to blocking and tackling to say, okay, the good old days where you had a, uh, an expediter. Um, you go out to the plant and you say, you got to find this part. You got to get to the customer because the penalties are so large. So improvements, I'm not seeing them right now. I'm just seeing a lot of requests for help with scheduling and getting product out the door and making sure raw material comes in. Let's see where the um, results ended up. It's a combination. So a lot of, uh, it's basically a tie between technology and process improvement to your point in line with what you're hearing, right? Um, some of those are facing restructuring. Um, surprising, upskilling is, is, is at the bottom. I didn't see that. Um, interesting. Well, it, it, it makes sense. Let's, let's take a look. I think um, across the automotive and aviation supply chains, the adjustments that they're making and the actions that they're taking um, are, are, a, are, are in line with the response of the audience, right? It is a, it's a combination uh, of getting better at looking into and leveraging data and what the systems tell us, but then also being creative about how we respond. We were uh, talking with another um, vehicle manufacturer who had the same issue, right? So shock absorbers for their shock absorbers for their um, for their snowmobiles were stuck behind a ship from the Evergreen in the Suez. And so what do they do? They shut production down? No. We saw in the journal this week, it was creative. They, they, shipped, they shipped their snowmobiles to the dealers. And as soon as the, uh, as soon as the uh, shock absorbers came in, they sent them to the dealerships for install at the service centers. Was it efficient? Um, not the most efficient, but it gave them time. Great quote. Um, what else are we seeing? Anything else to highlight there? Well, yeah, Oscar, I think, we, you know, hitting upon that and hitting upon the thoughts that we're building vehicles and putting the electronics in later, you're going to see this delayed um, warranty recall issue, right? When you do something out of sequence, okay, so now you got the dealership installing something they hadn't installed before. Mistakes happen. So we're going to see this uh, hangover in about six to nine months where you see early <laughs> warranty is going to, be, going to be up. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Damon, from... Your perspective, how do you, how are you seeing the energy, the energy in the OFS companies and some of the industrials clients that you're working with? How are they responding um, to this, to the headwinds? Yeah, so many, many of these folks had a, like I said earlier, had a rehire a number of their, their, their hands, if you will. Uh, but traditionally, when you're, Rehiring process is always challenging, but traditionally there, there's a training element there besides, you know, working the equipment. It's a lot of administrative um, tasks that go on in the field. Uh, that task has been largely done through paper, paper pushing or, or cell phone buying. So with all that said, uh, a number of our, our clients that have survived the storm, uh, the Oilfield Service storm or the bankruptcy storm, are investing uh, a lot in digital technology uh, where they can automate field ticketing to invoice faster, uh, work, workforce plan through uh, tools or apps, uh, you know, send communications out to, to send the red equipment out versus, you know, always having to pick up the cell phone and call somebody, hopefully they, hopefully they answer. So the digital movement is definitely uh, uh, coming in a faster wave for the oil field. Um, but we've also seen some cyber attacks. We, we all have read about the Colonial Pipeline incident uh, we have a number of midstream clients that are, you know, reinvesting, but also other clients that are investing more in, in cyber, uh, per, uh, cyber, uh, cyber prevention, if you will, of, of ransomware type attacks. Yeah, that was a there. that was a that was a crazy that was a crazy evolution across not just uh, the continental pipeline, but the uh, the meat market as well. It was pretty crazy. They shut down meat production plants for IBD, I believe. Cyber's cyber's real. The cyber threat's real. Investing in that and, and getting in front of that is is kind of an issue and kind yeah, of the think, new normal. I think everybody's dealing with that. For sure. One one other uh, new normal, if you will, is the ESG play, especially in the oil field, where they're putting in some technology to reduce or or watch their 
NOx or CO2 emissions. So we have yeah. a number of a uh, number of clients. Uh, you know, they're they're running diesel engines or compressors that run on natural gas, and they're looking for ways to uh, reduce that during various parts of the day, or measure it, or see if they have an equipment issue to uh, to to monitor it more real time, if you will. So, uh, and that's also becoming. You know, there, there's a maintenance side of that for both uh, maintaining the equipment, um, but also, like I said, from a from a technology point of view, monitoring that real time. So, we're seeing a lot of field services, and I, and I know OFS led the way a long time ago, but in, increasing um, increasing agility and efficiency in the way that they manage field service ticketing. And I laughed. I think uh, Jim Franks is uh, out there in the audience, and we when we were working with Chesapeake. Uh, in a previous life, we were doing a study around improving and, and optimizing some of the field service ticketing. Uh, and one of the, I'll never forget this. So when we were doing current state, the paper intensive processes, they would leave field service tickets for the company man to sign in a sawed off upside down Gatorade bottle uh, for approval. That sort of efficiency still exists, not just in oil and gas, uh, but outside of oil and gas in some of the other services industries uh, as, as well as uh, industrials. So getting more efficient with the people that are out there deployed, continuing to work, address uh, the demand issues in the field, technology is definitely enabling it. We're seeing a pickup in the activity around robotic process automation, um, dynamic mobility applications, a better use of data? Are we connecting signals uh, from customer orders to mobile fleets so they have the, you know, more while, while I'm here, uh, would, you like, would you like this type of discussion? Seeing a lot of that. Um, Spencer, from your perspective, can you share a little bit about how retail is responding. Yeah, no, absolutely, Oscar. And I, and I think there, you know, retailers are learning, uh, to your point, to be very responsive to those changing demand signals. Uh, starting on the, the left here, you know, we touched on omni-channel before, but this is really something that's been, you know, accelerated through the pandemic, where retailers found a lot of stranded uh, and seasonal inventory in stores and trying to figure out what to do to, to keep the lights on and make that inventory uh, productive. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar with, you know, retail uh, warehouse, you know, there, there's different assortments for shipping to a store where it's a full assortment versus online. It's a, a pack and a, and a pick, different individual uh, um, item. So, you know, what people have done is, you know, started shipping from stores and, and it allows them to do a, a number of things well. One, it starts addressing that last mile issue to be able to get the, the product closer to the customer so it comes in quicker. Um, it could helps with labor absorption. When you have idle labor in the stores during, you know, downtimes in the in the day, you can get have that labor, you know, packing and, and, and picking items. Uh, and then it helps with the inventory efficiency. So now now you can find places where you know style is turning, you know, less uh, you know less frequently, and it may be just you know a out of favor store. It may be you know different part of the market and things are misallocated, and you can get that you know inventory to the to the right customer. Um, you know, other things we've seen some of our CPG clients do, we, especially with higher ticket items, uh, is, is sort of, you go back to basics on, on just in time. Um, we're seeing people rebox um, items, um, take it back in, fresh in the box, make it a seasonal box, add something on, bring things in a brown box, and then, you know, the, the customer experience on top of that looks different make it more fungible between, you know, retailers who may demand their own SKUs like a Target or a Walmart where you really need to have a unique SKU. Uh, otherwise, anyone will, will take returns from, from other channels. Um, in the middle here, we have, you know, uh, buy online and pick up in store, BOPIS, that we, we touched on a little bit earlier. Um, and, you know, in, increasing the customers, improving the customer's experience when you bring them in the store, either for, you know, pick up or a return. And that return... You know, kind of you know, fits into the last column here with reverse supply chain logistics. Everybody yeah. knows e-commerce was up last year. It was up thirty over thirty percent. And those returns are three x as likely to those items are three times as likely to to come back. Um, and it's costly. 
the inventory is uh, inefficient. Uh, we've seen people, you know, uh, get creative and have that inventory shipped back to the store where someone can make, you know, an educated decision. Can it go back on the rack or on the aisle or does it need to go right to discount because it's, because it's damaged? Um, online retailers are using things like TrueFit, um, where you can compare some of your, you know, clothing on your rack across different, you know, manufacturers to, to what you're buying. So you, you get the right size. Uh, right. And, and people using TrueFit have seen a 10% decline in returns, uh, which is which is really impressive and, and drops right to you know the, the bottom line. Uh, it was, so I it think was, it's reverse supply. Yep. I, I was just going to comment on that too, Spencer. The, um, you know, I was, we were, we're in the graduation season and picking out some graduation uh, gifts for friends and family. And I was, uh, I saw marketing is working. So I saw to um, ask, which is a boot manufacturer um, here, custom boots at uh, non custom boot prices, which is great, high quality merchandise. I saw them advertise. I looked online, uh, ordered a pair of boots, and um, we ordered two sizes to make sure one fit. They sent the return to their Dallas store because they knew that um, in, the, in the event, we ordered two pairs to see which one would fit for inventory purposes. Rather than going back to the distribution center, they sent it to the store. So using stores as uh, distribution nodes or repositioning inventory, but thinking through the process and the ways of working that they would send a return item because they know we ordered two of them, send one back to the Dallas store uh, instead of the distribution center. So behaviors are changing too. It's, it's interesting to note. Absolutely. I think, I think a lot of yeah. that's enabled. I think a lot of that is enabled by what we're hearing more and more of, which is digitization. Um, so, as we think about that, we get the question a lot, what, is, what exactly does that mean? We're seeing people use data better. We're seeing people uh, leverage platforms that they have used uh, better. Uh, processes are changing. We're still getting comments from the supply chain and operations teams that say, gosh, I'm swimming in data uh, and I'm inundated, but I, I've just got to focus on getting the customer or our customer orders out the door. What we do know is this, and what we have seen is this, those that are um, investing in the digitization, the synchronization of uh, the synchronization of processes, data technology to drive efficiency across operations um, and the supply chain without uh, and, and maintaining customer service levels without necessarily increasing uh, the working capital tied to inventory, optimizing inventory. Those that are, most of their initiatives are organized around demand, de better demand sensing, better demand forecasting. Uh, they're doing a lot of scenario uh, analysis. We'll talk about that here in a bit. Um, incorporating and, and better, uh, working better across their TMS and WMS, so transportation and warehouses. And executives that are Investing in those types of initiatives are, turns out, 2x likely to report better revenue growth than those that did not. But in the, in the whole, I would say what we're also seeing is 42% of organizations that, uh, that say uh, have responded to at least some of our surveys that organizations uh, have accelerated some of their digitization plans plans that were put on hold because of the revenue opportunity that 19 represented. But once they hit 20, 42% have said they pulled them back and accelerated back towards their digitization plans. Um, for the, the, the next era, what is that, right? So how are we dealing? How do we get better? How do we leverage technology better? How do we deal with digitization to enable faster, better data-driven decisions? I would say that scenario modeling is kind of something that's, that is emerged as well, right? People are asking questions, where do we, where do we put our warehouses? Uh, how do we optimize our fleet? Inventory is one thing. Uh, how are we dealing with capacity constraints and demands in different parts of the country um, that um, 
aren't necessarily aligned with where our inventory, our fleets, and our warehousing is. How are we adjusting our networks? And scenario modeling has, has enabled that. One of our oil and gas clients down in Australia uh, was concerned with the ability to take advantage of an uptick in, uh, in, in oil and gas pre-pandemic. And using this, using this digital twin, they were, they were able to identify if they could produce and they could increase storage, they could take advantage of a giant revenue boost uh, and profitability boost through um, creating more storage um, that they could then get for product to then get to the market. So using data, whether it's a better across the buy side, across the planning side, doing the digital twin analysis, your, your, your TMS or your LMS, your warehouse management system. We're seeing all kinds of, uh, of AI solutions from IBMs, from software providers, Llamasoft, RiverLogic, Canaxis, and then also better data visualization to shorten those decision cycles, to provide integrated and siloed, um, to, to, to integrate those siloed uh, business units and data sets um, and just drive better outcomes. Um, as we think through uh, the future and I, we working towards closing, I'd, I'd like to ask one more polling question if we can. And that is, who is driving these initiatives, uh, investments in performance improvement and adjusting to these headwinds in either process or technology? Who's driving this and sponsoring this in your organization? Is it the CEO? Is it your business unit? Is it the CFO? Or for some of our private equity, uh, our equity sponsors and their management teams, is it the operating partner or the local management team? Or is it someone else? What are we seeing? Adrian, from your perspective, I'd, I'd love to hear from you guys. What, who is driving the majority of, uh, of the initiative? Who's sponsoring your engagement on these fix-it programs? Yeah, good question. You know, I think it varies. Um, uh, in the, uh, uh, the one client that I mentioned, the instrument, um, it was the CFO, um, and it was focused, interestingly enough, both on uh, performance improvement, um, shop floor optimization, Lean Six Sigma implementation in conjunction with upgrading their ERP um, and other ancillary systems. So in that case, it was, it was CFO. Um, you know, some organizations, there's a COO, uh, and, and they'll uh, play a, a key role in that. Um, in the, the resin supplier uh, or manufacturer that I talked about, really the CEO is, is pretty engaged uh, in, in driving a lot of the mission. There. Interesting. David, how about you? What are you seeing in the aviation and defense industries? It's, yeah, it's kind of a tale of two cities. I mean, the, the, the commercial aviation sector has not seen the rebound that a number of these other sectors have. We're still kind of in, at the low point in the demand cycle. So a lot of our work is with the operating partners and CEOs as people are, are primarily concerned with liquidity and, and frankly, survival. Um, whereas on the defense side, you know, the defense sector has remained very robust and uh, a lot of the, the engagements we're currently running uh, are in the office of the chief operating officer or president. People are, are leaning forward and trying to lean out processes or develop better uh, manufacturing and um, uh, kind of back office and, and middle office uh, business processes. And that really tends to fall under the purview of the, the COO or maybe the CFO. Interesting. The, the response is, uh, the leading response was at 26% was the business unit um, tied with other. Um, and then behind that was the CEO and the CFO. So traditionally, I would, we have seen CFO and or business units drive it. I was reading a survey by McKinsey and Co. the other day. Uh, and, and the output of a similar survey, 200 respondents that had invested in technology, those that the CEO drove were twice as likely to accelerate the, um, the recovery um, and forward earnings um, almost two to three times 
uh, as effectively as those that had uh, the initiatives led by business unit or other. Not surprisingly, everyone wants to pay. Not surprisingly, everyone wants to pay attention to what the CEO has to has to say and, and garner his attention. But CEO doesn't always have time to lead these types of initiatives. So I, I see it. It's it's interesting. Most most of the folks here are saying business unit or other. Good. Um, as we summarize, I think you know I I believe the team would echo this. The panel, you guys would echo this. The experience from working with our, our client partners uh, as they adjust their priorities, their agendas, and then respond uh, with a myriad of these headwinds, this type of activity, the hills that we've climbed together, the challenges that we've overcome, all of this content, all of this knowledge, all this perspective is going to fill business and history books for B-schools and classes for decades, I think. I think... Um, one of the things that jumps out too is, you know, I, I think as logisticians and uh, and operations folks, regardless of industry, we always benefit from asymmetrical data and lessons learned and sharing. Um, whether it's how you deployed uh, and improved processes or how you've connected and shared information through some of the digitization efforts, all of these. Uh, all of these, at least across our partner group, we've learned that we can, we, the outcomes are better when we collaborate more. And so whether you're focused on technology or process, those can be, um, those can vary for sure. But one thing that, that cannot, I would say, is the ability to collaborate creatively. That remains paramount. So as we shift to close, I, I, we've been talking a lot about the um, we've been talking a lot about the past and what we're seeing and how people are responding. You're going to see you, you, the the former slide mentioned the themes that we were seeing to remain resilient, right? Improving how you how you plan and manage your business through SNOP how you're incorporating and reprioritizing KPIs and identifying different capabilities that need attention. Uh, thinking about and getting your head around the, 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 the nature of your business, your products, your business line, not just the customers that you're serving, but where the profitability lies, how their product mix varies. Within that product mix uh, and within their order flows, what sort of behaviors are they representing? Where is, does it, is it repeatable or is it multi non-repeatable? Uh, and, and what should we adjust and how should we adjust our business? These are exciting times for, for supply chain and operations leadership. And it's, it's, it's going to drive uh, a lot of activity. We have come a long way in a very short period of time. But now let's think about this time next year. So kind of a hot sports opinion for, uh, for the next 12 months as we transition to looking to the future. Guys, if you could give me your perspective, give me two points. Where do you think we'll be this time next year? Chris from Automotive. Yeah, just quick. I could talk about these at length, but I know we're short on time. So I'm hoping that maybe this crisis will finally drive part commonization. You know, why do we have to have six different styles of this, this forging or this? Um, I'm hoping they'll finally make the supply chain a little leaner by doing that. And then we, we talked about this earlier. Um, question came in, you know, is it time to bring suppliers closer to the assembly plants, closer to home? Should low cost country sourcer, sourcing be secondary to continuity supply? I think the answer is yes. It's just how far can we go? Thank you very much, David. What are we going to see in aerospace and defense? Yeah, sure. I, I think in the supply chain, you're going to see consolidation as, as the kind of the low levels of demand can continue to drag out. You're going to see some of these smaller suppliers that I, I referred to earlier start to combine or, or, or get acquired. On the defense side, I think you see um, you know activity in the space, whether it's M&A or investment in capabilities, uh, uh, continue to accelerate. You know, a lot of the defense suppliers that we work with are 
you know, growing rapidly and they're, they're investing heavily to make sure that their manufacturing and supporting business processes are scalable, yeah. uh, are based in technology as opposed to, uh, you know, on a whiteboard. And we're going to continue to see that, uh, that trend continue. Thank you, Damon. The, the question of the hour, are we going to see a hundred dollar oil? Yeah, I think so. This is my hot take. I think we're, we're going to see that <laughs> for sure in the next 18 months. Uh, it's also inverse to U.S. dollar, but moreover, it's additional regulations happening in states around fracking, uh, the yeah. lack of capital that's being reinvested into the oil field. The fear of losing that capital will create, uh, you know, kind of some more that more that demand, uh, more more demand issues, or, or I should say, less supply to meet the demand, uh, especially as we get back on the roads and in the air and and traveling again. So yeah, that's that's my prediction. Hot take. Adrian, from, from your sector, what are you seeing next year? Where, where will we be? Well, I, I think a couple of things, right? I think there will be a continued focus on supply chain resiliency um, and, you know, a combination of sort of existing supply chain as well as some um, diversification through nearshoring as well as onshoring. I don't think the, the existing offshore supply chain will go away, but we'll get some redundancy. And, and uh, built into the system. Now, on inventory levels, I, you know, I think there'll be uh, some increases in inventory uh, to create a buffer, but I think there'll be more of a focus on, you know, proper SNOP and really inventory, and ensuring you've got the right inventory, the right quantities, um, and so, you know, kind of bifurcating the, the, the inventory and, uh, and focusing on those key parts that, that you really need. Thank you. Spencer, let's, uh, what, what, is, what are you seeing next year? What's your hot sports opinion in, in retail and CPG? Yeah, it's going to be a story of you know, uh, making sure your inventory is uh, efficient, um, that you can be efficient with, with labor. Uh, we are going to see, I think, prices increase, um, you know, commodities. I think some of that's going to you know, come through and the you know, labor costs will go up. Uh, the dollar is going to be devalued, and we're going to see more store closures, more in the, the B and C uh, markets, not in the, the you know the A malls. Um, so uh, retail is going to continue to evolve, and you know, kind of continue to work through this tension between you know uh, in store and e commerce, and you know, balancing it with uh, with omni channel. Good intel, good insight. Thank you very much. Well. All in all, I would say we're living in very interesting times, which depending on where in the world you hear that, that's either a blessing or a curse. Uh, but I, I'm, uh, I'm excited to tackle the challenges and work through this. We've covered so much ground. We've made up from the pause that took place a year and a quarter ago to working with our client partners to rebuild and reopen their businesses. The, the path, the hike has seemed like a summit of one of the major 14ers in Colorado somewhere. But it's uh, the inside perspective, I think, has been fantastic. It's a great time to work in the logistics and operations space for sure. Thank you, guys. Uh, thank you all for uh, staying with us, for joining us here. Please stay tuned. As I mentioned, we'll be pushing an email to share this content and our contact info. Look forward to visiting with you again on our next Riveron Ops and Supply Chain webinar. Thanks again. Have a great week.